Good afternoon and welcome to our service here at Galilee Baptist Church uh, for uh, this uh, first Sunday in September. And uh, I'm just going to jump right into our passage here uh, this evening. And so if you want to turn over to John chapter 5, John chapter 5, and I'm really going to continue in our series about Jesus as the Son of God. And John's gospel, really, you could go to any chapter and, and uh, show us uh, that, that that's who he is. That's John's theme, that Jesus is God's son. But let's start John chapter 5. And I want to read uh, verses uh, 5 through 9 here to begin. And then we'll pray and then we'll get into our message here uh, this afternoon. Verse number 5 says, A certain man was there which had an infirmity thirty and eight years. And when Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been a long time in this case, he said unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? The impotent man said, Sir, I have no man, when the water is troubled, to put me into the pool. But while I am coming, another steppeth down before me. Jesus saith unto him, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. And immediately the man was made whole, took up his bed, and walked, and on the same day was the Sabbath. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your truth. Thank you that it is uh, valid and truthful unto this very day. We thank you that everything verifies it, both the changes of life and historical discoveries um, continue to verify for us the truthfulness of your word. But Lord, we know that you are true and that you are truthful. And so we can always depend upon what it says. Lord, I pray for your blessing as we look into this passage here in John chapter 5, that your uh, glory would, would be shown, your greatness would be discovered. Uh, Lord, that your spirit would teach us what we need to know and understand. And Lord, then give us grace to follow through with, with that which you'd have us to do. Lord, if there is a single person listening to this who has never trusted Christ, I pray for uh, their salvation, that they would see the greatness of Christ and what he's done for us. Thank you again for your truth in Jesus' name. Amen. So here um, I want to continue this, uh, as I said, uh, Jesus as God's son. And so the title uh, of the son of God given to Jesus is found 30 some times in the New Testament, primarily in the Gospels. Uh, but a number of times elsewhere. And our text that we really started this series is from Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 2, where it gives eight designations, uh, some of them titles, some of them designations of Christ. And so the first one is that he is God's son. And so that's what we're looking at, and, and that's where we started to go through the Gospels and look at the title, the Son of God, uh, as used in the Gospels for Jesus Christ. And so we're to letter F here, a number of things we've looked at. I'm not going to reiterate those here, but the, several times the Lord himself declares that. And those are primarily here in the Gospel of John. And so we have seen that uh, when, uh, in, in relationship to the man born blind, that Jesus declares himself to be the son of God to that man, and he gets, he gets spiritually saved, eternally saved, praise the Lord. And then in John chapter 10 and verse 36, we saw it in relationship to a series of questions that says, you know, who, who are you? And the true identity of Christ and Jesus, in spite of their calling it blasphemy and willing to stone him, Jesus declares it clearly uh, through the scripture and through what he's done. And then we saw in John chapter 11 and verse number four with, with Lazarus and his death and then his resurrection um, that Jesus declares that to be, be proof that he is the very son of God, that he was glorified as God's son through that uh, miraculous uh, raising Lazarus from the dead. And then here in John chapter 5 is, is where we're going. Jesus is, is walking through a very crowded area. It was called the Pool of Bethesda. And, and it was like a, a figure 8, though it wasn't circular. It was squared off. And so, and there, so there was a porch in the middle. There was uh, one on the side and one on each end and then one on this side. And so there were five porches. They weren't, they weren't in a pentagon shape, but, but more or less a figure 8, but squared up. And so there were lots of people there, uh, lame and, and uh, blind and sick and diseased. And just, I mean, it was really um, people that didn't want, others didn't want to be around in a sense. And so they're there and Jesus was walking through there. I'm sure he encouraged a number of people, but, he, but we only have a record that he healed one man there. 
And it's this lame man who had been there, as it says, we read, 38 years, and Jesus uh, gave him three commands. He said, rise, there in verse 8, take up thy bed, and then the third one was walk, and, and he did so, okay? And, 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 and before he knew who Jesus was, Jesus slipped back out through the crowd, and, and the man didn't even know who, who it was that had, had, had said this and had healed him. So as he was carrying this little, probably rolled up sort of mat that he was laying on, as he was carrying that, not a really a burden, but as he was carrying that, the religious uh, Jews came to him and said, hey, what are you doing carrying your bed, your, your mat roll on, on the Sabbath day? Because that's considered work, and you're supposed to be resting, you're violating the Sabbath. And he said, hey, the guy who told me get up and carry my bed and walk, I, he, 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 that's what he told me to do. And... Um, so, so they, they were uh, wondering who it was. And so Jesus met the man a little bit later and really told him, hey, you need to change your path. Don't continue in sin. You need to follow God. Uh, and, and, and then immediately the guy didn't follow Jesus. The guy went immediately back to the religious leaders and said, hey, it was Jesus who told me that. It was Jesus who told me to get up and, and to take my bed and walk and thus violate the Sabbath. It's his fault, not mine. And so as we come to verse 16 here in this text, Notice that these people were, were very furious. And therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus. They pursued him. They, they gave him trouble and sought to slay him. So they had a desire to kill him because he had done these things. It's interesting, these things, plural, on the Sabbath day. So it seems as though as John's writing this, that he puts that in there uh, in, in, because he wanted people to know, hey, Jesus didn't do just a single event on the Sabbath. There was other ones, the other Gospels give a little more detail about some other things he did on the Sabbath day. Um, and, and so uh, really he didn't violate the Sabbath law based on God's truth but based on their interpretation of things. But anyway, uh, so, so uh, they, they, they were really upset. So verse 17, Jesus speaks to them, answers them, though they don't really question him, but he answers the situation is the concept there. And, and notice what he says, my father worketh hitherto and I work. And so this controversy, remember it was, a, it was, Related to the Sabbath, because Jesus had healed this man on the Sabbath. Apparently, it seems like all this stuff happened in a single day that they came to him and, and this confrontation and, and all, all that went on, his healing and the man telling the Jews who it was finally on a second visit uh, with Christ and so forth. And, and so they, they were, they were um, upset. So Jesus says, my father worketh hitherto. And so he's, he uses that controversy to to teach about himself, this Sabbath thing. And so really the Sabbath, remember it was inaugurated uh, back in Genesis chapter two. And, and it says there in Genesis chapter two, one through three, uh, I think it's verse two, that God rested on the seventh day of all his work that he had made. And so when Jesus said, my father worked hither, hitherto, he was, he was using that, that idea of the Sabbath, okay? God, my, my father was working unto the, up, up to all the way unto this day. And, and, and then it says, and I work. So now I'm, I'm continuing what my father left off. Where he's left off, I begin. In, 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 a, in a sense, that's, that's what he's getting across when he says, my, you know, God worketh hitherto. Now, that heightened their animosity. Notice verse 18. Therefore, the Jews sought the more to kill him. They were more stirred up. They were more angry. They were more furious. And they give a reason, notice, because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his father, making himself equal with God. So think about it. So remember, Jesus said, I work. When did he do his work? He did that work on the Sabbath. Okay. And, and so for the Jews, remember, they were based on Exodus chapter 20, one of the Ten Commandments that God says on that Sabbath day, that seventh day, you shall rest there in Exodus 20 and verse 11. But Jesus, so Jesus had broken the Sabbath. So they were upset about that. But also, remember, he said, my father worketh hitherto. And the Jews understood that his father in the context there, that what he meant was it was God. And so they say, they made God, he said also that God was his father. And it's interesting, that little pronoun, uh, his father, it's, it's very emphatic and it, it has an emphasis. It's, it's, it's like him saying that he, the idea that God was his own father in a very unique way. 
And so they, they saw that, and so the result of that, they said, hey, the meaning of that is that he's making himself equal with God. So, so all of that put together, breaking the Sabbath, calling God his father, making himself equal with God, those all infuriated the Jews. Now, understand, the Jews recognize that God's rest on the seventh day there in the creation week in, in Genesis chapter uh, 2, that, that what it meant was Jesus, that, that God ceased from creating anything else, okay, uh, in, 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 in that, that, that creation week. But it didn't mean he stopped. His sovereign power was still at work. His sovereign power now would be preserving his creation, keeping it up, and then also uh, guiding and directing uh, humanity from, from, from the time of Adam all the way to this day. And so they knew that God worked on the Sabbath too, okay? So, so they understood that. So humanity, based on the commandment, humanity was to rest, but God never took a day off. And so when Jesus said on the Sabbath, I work, he, he, was, he was doing what God did. God still worked on the Sabbath, but man was not. And so he was again making himself equal with this God who continued to work. There's a lot of, um, you know, false prophets um, false religions that, that would say, and I've read a couple of them, that would say, you know, when Jesus said, my father worketh hitherto and I work, and then verse 18, the Jews were all upset about, about what he was doing, that they said, well, the Jews didn't understand what Jesus meant by what he said, because he was not saying that he was God, because that's what they, they, they deny. But you know what? They understood exactly what Jesus meant by what he said. And, and by Jesus' answer, we, we know that Jesus, he, what he'll show here is, hey, you know what? You understood it right. Uh, that, that is what I said. That is what I meant. And Jesus was very precise and very particular about what he spoke. He spoke with clarity and he said what he meant. And he meant what he said. And, and if he'd meant to say something different, he would have said it different. And so, uh, you know, there's some aspects as we're long away from Jewish culture and of that day that, that uh, we don't always understand all of it. But, but he spoke with clarity and the people of his day understood it very clearly. And so they, they knew he was saying that he was equal with God. And, and so in the, in the answer here, it's interesting, and we'll go down from verses 19 all the way to verse 30. Um, and then there's more there, but that's as far as we'll go here this time. Because this is where he answers this, this statement about you're making yourself equal with God. Well, he uses the term, and here's why we're coming to this passage, the Son of God in verse 25. So he refers to himself as the Son of God. But in the rest of these verses, nine times the, the Lord uses a, a shortened title. And not the Son of God, but it issues as the word Son, the Son. And he, he's speaking of, obviously, the same thing. And so what he's showing us in this passage, he's trying to communicate to them, hey, God the Father and God the Son are, are equal in their essence and are in perfect harmony in their work. They're doing the same thing. And, and so that's as Jesus said a little later there in, in John chapter 10, I and my Father are one. And so there's a very clear uh, statement. And so the healing of the lame man was a demonstration that God was at work in his son and through his son and his son was working through the father um, even on the Sabbath day. And so there's two points here to show that, that Jesus is, is equal in status and in perfect union with the father and thus to show him to be the very the son of God. And so number one, understanding this truth of perfect harmony and equality. So how, how it works. So verse number 19. So Jesus begins, he said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, and there's a great outline here that he says that three times in this passage. Remember, that's an oath of truthfulness. Jesus saying, truly, truly, I say unto you. And so it was like, like making an oath before God that he's telling you the truth. Uh, because this is somewhat startling for the Jews. But he says, uh, I, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself. Okay, when, when Jesus made that statement, so here's how this works. He was saying, I, and in my ministry as the Messiah, I do nothing independent of my Father. He says, I'm always in line with him. I'm never trying to be independent. Remember, remember the devil's temptations of Christ? 
Remember, he always began it with this. If thou be the son of God. Now that if there is not a sense of doubt, but it's, it's saying, it's, it's like if there was an auto accident out here and there was a policeman standing on the curb. And I say, if you're a policeman, let's take care of this. Well, he obviously is a policeman. His, his car is there, his uniform's on, and, and so he needs to take care of it. So I'm not doubting this a policeman. I'm just saying, hey, if you're that, then let's get this done. And so Jesus, when the devil came and said, if you're the son of God, do this or do that. He, he wasn't trying to create doubts in the mind of Christ. He knew who he was. But he was saying this, based on the reality of who you are, Jesus, based on the reality of your essence as the Son of God, do it on your own. Take care of yourself. Live independent of your Father. Live independent of God. But Jesus always refused because he was not willing to do so. Because that's not what he was. That's not what he did. That's, that's, that's not. And so as he says here, I can do nothing of myself. And let's remember that, 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 that truth. Because Philippians chapter 2 said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Let that mind be in you. God's people, we, you and I, are to work in perfect harmony with God our Father, our Heavenly Father. And that's always been humanity's greatest struggle since the fall, is, is, to, is to keep our heart in harmony with God our Father. And, and boy, that's really true. But that's what Jesus did. I, I do nothing of myself. And then he said, but what he seeth the Father do. So, so the, the Son does what he sees the Father do, for what things soever he doeth, the Father doeth, those also, or these also, doeth the Son likewise. So it's almost like Jesus is waiting and watching well, where's, where's it's his, his heavenly father? So it's almost like he's waiting and watching uh, for what God's doing from heaven. And that's what the son's going to do on earth. And so what is the point? They're working in perfect harmony. What the, the son's actions are the father's actions and the father's actions are the son's actions. That's how close in harmony they are. We know they're distinct in persons, but they're one in essence. They're both God and they work in perfect harmony harmony together and, and and no one could do that unless they had you know divine power and had a divine nature with divine insight and was was equal and in harmony together and that's what Jesus is in relationship to his father and so that's that's how it works and then it continues how it works on the father's side in verse number 20 it says for the father loveth the son so Jesus knew he had full assurance that his father loved the son. And so there's a connection there. And what's neat is the, this word, the Greek word for love there. It's phileo, not agapao. And now, now those words are, are, are often, they're synonyms, so they can overlap one another. They can use, point to the same thing. But if you were to make a distinction between those terms, you could say agapao as a, as a, as a, as a primary focus is, to, is a sacrifice of self for the benefit of someone else. And so that's agapao. But this term is phileo. Phileo uh, is, is, is a term that has an aspect of friendship. Uh, of, of companionship, of, of harmony. And so that's phileo. And that's the term used here. And I think that's what he's saying. My father loves me. We, we are in harmony together. And then he says, he showeth him all things that himself doeth. The father loves the son and shows the son what he's doing. Okay. So remember verse 19, the son seeth. Verse 20, the father showeth. And so again, they're working in, in harmony. They're doing the same thing at the same time, in the same way, at the same place. Both of them are fulfilling the eternal plan of God, which is their plan. Okay, it's what they decided and they're working harmony together. So in the sense, the son on earth is depending and looking. And the father in heaven is loving and showing because they both work together in that loving harmony. So understanding the truth, how it works, that's how it works. The second thing is what it means. So as it continues in verse number 20, it says there, and he will show him greater works than these that ye may marvel. Well, what great, well, greater works than the, the, the man who was, who was lame who can now walk. And, and, and so Jesus is going to explain what those greater works are. Notice the first word in verse 21. It's for. There's an explanation. First word in verse 22. For. Another explanation. 
And so here are the greater works that the Father is going to show the Son and that he's going to accomplish. And so verse 21 says, For as the Father raiseth up the dead and quickeneth them, so there's a resurrection and life, okay? Quicken means to, to give life to or to make alive. Okay, so the Father has that power to raise the dead and quickeneth them, even so the Son quickeneth, makes alive whom he will. And so all of life in the universe came from God. All of life. Okay, and, and those that are, are spiritually dead, the Father can make alive. And so the same thing is, is, is uh, the Son has the same ability and he does it whom he will. And so both of them have this, this power, this sovereign power over life itself. And then verse 22. For the father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the son. Now the, now the father, as we'll see a little bit later, the God the father is not absent when, when judgment takes place. But the ultimate decisions about a person's eternal destiny is in the hands of the Lord Jesus Christ in the hands of the Son of God. Revelation 1.18 says, I am he that, Jesus speaking of himself, I am he that liveth and was, was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore, amen, and I have the keys of hell and of death. And those speak of eternal destinies that Jesus is in, in charge of. Now it's interesting, you go back again to the Jewish rabbis and what they taught even at, before or, or a little bit after the time of Christ that we have written. And so this is what they were teaching about God's work on the Sabbath, okay? So, so as, they, as they discuss these things and they go through a logical series of, of, of uh, reasonings and, and they say that you know God did work on the Sabbath, and, and so they knew that he stopped the creating, but he still was, was, was at work, and as we mentioned earlier. But in, in relationship to creation, they said that his power never stopped because if it ceased, his power stopped, then, then life itself would cease to exist because the power of life is in him. And then, and then they said also in relationship to uh, humanity um, that, that God's work on the ha Sabbath is shown in two ways. Number one, again, an aspect of life. That, that when a baby was born, and there were babies born on the Sabbath, obviously, okay? And so, so that was a demonstration that God was at work giving new life in this world through, through the birth of an infant. And then the second thing they said, that, that he was um, also, that God was, was judging. And they, they looked at it this way, that death, of course, was the result of sin, part of God's judgment upon humanity. That's death came because of sin. And so they looked at death as a, as a sign of God's judgment, okay? And so, so the, those two things, they said that God works on the Sabbath in life and in judgment. And so it's, it's, no, um, it, 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 it's no coincidence, I think it's very purposeful, that the Lord Jesus, as he talks here, he says, you know what, my Father works, and I have the same power to work in, in, in the same way in two specific areas, Remember verse number 21, he quickeneth, he gives life. Okay, and then in verse number 22, he, he has judgment. Uh, he, the, 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 all that judgment is committed unto the Son. Those two things, life and judgment, or life and death in a sense, both of those are in the hands of Jesus. And so he tells them that. That was, that was the prerogative of God. And Jesus is very clear. He's saying, hey, I'm the son of God. You're asking me, hey, what do you mean by what you said? Are you making yourself equal with God? He says, indeed I am. Very clearly to the Jew of that day. And then, so, so that's how it works. That's what it means. And then last of all, what it's, why it's important. Verse 23, and this is where it gets a little bit personal, even for the Jews then and for us today. Verse 23, that all men, okay? So, so verse number um, you know, 19 and 20, uh, that, that we're working in perfect harmony together and, and the Father's committed life into the hands of the Son and judgment into the hands of the Son. And the purpose of that, that all men should honor the Son even as they honor the Father. So there's, a, there's this perfect union, there's this equal essence and therefore both deserve equal honor. Now for the Jews that would have been startling for a, for a man standing before them. To say that he is the son of God and in saying so that he deserves equal honor with God the Father. Isaiah 42 verse 8 says, I am the Lord, that is my name and my glory will I not give to another. 
No one in this world is to be uh, exalted and honored and praised on equal par with God. Yet that's exactly what Jesus was saying. That he was clearly declaring that that is how it should be. That perfect union, equal stature with, with the Father. And so that's what he has. And therefore, there needs to be, rec he needs to be recognized with an honor that, that is only fit for God. And that would include worship and so forth. And so Jesus is an aspect of that. And then on the other side of it, he that honoreth not the Son... So, so someone who doesn't give him the honor that he deserves as is specified in equality with, with the Father. He says, he that honoreth not the Son, honoreth not the Father. Now notice that last phrase, I think it's important, which sent him, or which hath sent him. So when one fails to, to recognize the Son as a divine being, that he dishonors the Father who sent him here. So each, we understand each member of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, have a unique function within that Trinita Trinitarian uh, you know, union okay, of the triune God. Okay, each of them are fully God, but each of them are distinct from one another, so different in their persons. But we need to be clear, any religious system or any religious group or really non-religious group as far as that's concerned, who minimizes Jesus is disgracing God the Father who sent him. Okay, you can't minimize Jesus and honor the God who sent him. As we looked at already um, earlier today, 1 John 5.10, to deny the testimony that God the Father gives of his Son. How does he do that? Scripture. How does he do that? Jesus' life and ministry, his death, his resurrection, all those kind of things. To, to minimize those is to call, as it says there in 1 John 5, 10, is to call God a liar. Wow. So to fail to see Jesus as the Son of God is to say that God has sinned by lying about Jesus to all humanity. Boy, that's, a, that's, that's whoa, wow, but don't do that. Okay, so, so understand the truth. That's what it is. We've seen how it works, what it means, why it's important. And then the second thing in verses 24 through 30, I'm calling it responding to the truth. Okay, so first of all, verse 24. So he goes right into an, an opportunity, human opportunity. And again, notice he says, Verily, verily, I say unto you. Here's a truth of oath, oath, truth, an oath of truthfulness. A truth of oathfulness. Um, an oath of truthfulness, okay? He says, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me. Now notice it's interesting there. He doesn't say, He that heareth my word and believes on my message. Or believes me. He doesn't say that. He says, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me. And so, there, again, he's, he's speaking of perfect harmony. Jesus is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. The emphasis of those ministries were at different time frames, in a sense. It was, it, you know, but all of them work in perfect harmony. And part of this is saying the message of the Father that he gave throughout the Old Testament, the same message I'm giving in my life and ministry here in the New Testament. And then, and then also the Holy Spirit's work after Jesus ascended back up to the Father's right hand. So, so we, we know these things are, are all together. And so Jesus says, hey, we are, are working together to respond to me is to respond to the Father. To reject me is to reject the Father. So he that heareth my words and believeth on him that sent me, you got everlasting life. You got life everlasting. You got... God's type of life, eternal life, everlasting life, same, same terms, same concepts. And he said, you get that right now, you have it, you have it, you have it right now. It's in your possession at this present moment. If you'll hear my word and believe on him that sent me. And so that, that, that life does last forever, um, and, but, it, but it never ends and it takes you into God's blessed presence. And so the fact is, because you have that positive aspect, the negative is you'll not come into condemnation. That will never happen when you have God's life in you, when you respond to the Lord Jesus Christ. But notice how he ends that verse in verse 24. But is passed from death unto life. And the word passed is in a perfect tense. That means it's, it's an accomplished fact. It'll never be changed. 
It has continuing results. So it's a permanent move that you'll never return back to where you used to be. And so when you get saved, God moves you from the realm of, 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 of law and judgment and, and condemnation and darkness and death, okay, to the realm of grace and mercy and light and love and life, okay, as he says here. And you cannot go back and you'll never want to go back if you've truly trusted Christ and experienced his saving grace. So that's the opportunity. He says, hey, responding to the truth, here's the opportunity. And here's your assurance in verses 25 through 30, your assurance. And so Jesus wants to make sure you understand why, why his promises are certain in verse 24. In fact, as we go through here, uh, you remember back in verses 21 through 23, there were two things that he says that the son has life. He can give life and he's the one who will bring uh, judgment. And so those two themes are come back out again in this portion as God gives us an, an assurance of what he can do. So, so he gives life and he will judge all humanity. So verse 25, let's read that now. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming. And now is, that's important. The hour is coming and now is. And I think he meant the hour is coming from Old Testament prophecies, from things he has already said and from truth from the Old Testament. The hour is coming and now is. It's right now. When the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, there's our term, and they that hear shall live. And so right now the opportunity is open that you can experience the power of the life-giving Ability of the Son of God, if you'll just hear and believe, He'll raise the spiritually dead in sin and give them life. That's if you'll hear His voice. And the idea is responding to what He has to say right now. And then verse 26, 4, He's explaining this a little further. For as the Father hath life in Himself, so hath He given the, to the Son to have life in Himself. And when, uh, as, so, so both of them, both the Father and the Son, He says here, they have life in themselves. Now what does that mean? That means they're self-existing. That's, that's an attribute of God alone. Everything in this world is dependent, everything that has life is dependent upon God for that life. In him is life, okay? That's what we have. With, with, uh, it says in, in Colossians 1 that by him all things exist. Okay, that, that by him all things consist, I mean. And, and that consistent means he's holding it all together. And so the power of Christ, he has life in himself. That is an attribute, as I said, is only of God. Everything else in this, this universe has its existence, is dependent on God. Dependent on God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. But God depends on nothing. Now, you know, you may say, hey, well, there's a contradiction of terms here as you, as you look at that in verse 26. So the Father has life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself. Well, he's, if he has life in himself, how does it be given? And I think what he's speaking about here is, is the Son's earthly ministry, Jesus in his earthly ministry. Remember how, how he, 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 he lives, he lived his, he conducted his ministry here on this earth. He lived his life on this earth as a human being. Though he was 100% God, fully God, but taking on human flesh, he lived a, a, a life of humanity. And so his being fully God, when he, when he came to this earth in ministry, he submitted to the Father to such an extent. He was so committed that he would, or even you could say could, only demonstrate the reality of his deity according to his Father's will. Remember verse 19? The Son can do nothing of himself. That is the sense. I don't demonstrate my deity as the Son of God unless the Father directs me to do so. I'm in perfect Harmony with him. I do nothing of myself. And so as it says here in verse 26, hey, he has life in himself and therefore, verse 24 and 25, you know, if you hear what I say and believe on him that sent me, verse 20 or 24 and then verse 25, hey, if you hear my voice, I can give you life because I have life in myself. That's, a, that's why we can be certain that with an assurance when we trust Christ that we have life because the Son has given us life. Verse 27. 
and hath given him authority to execute judgment. So now we shift from, from verse 25 and 26 about life, giving life, having life, verse 27, to judgment. The Father hath given him, so remember verse 26, he gave him to have life in himself, verse 27, and I also hath given him authority to execute judgment also, now notice this, because he is the Son of Man. So the Son of God became the Son of Man in the Incarnation. And being that earth-born Messiah, he has been given the authority to judge. And I think part of that is because as the Son of Man, as this earth-born Messiah, carrying out ministry in faith to his Father, in an obedience to his Father, he knows what it's like to conduct the life on this earth and to live in response to God while you're going on this earth. And no one faced more opposition, more difficulties in life. Than, than, than Jesus. We find even here, they're, they're trying to kill him. And this is not, not at the end of his earthly ministry. This is, this is earlier. And so the, the Lord Jesus faced that. And so when people stand before him for judgment as a son of man, th there's no excuses. There's no excuses for, for people saying, hey, there's why I didn't serve God. Here's why I didn't depend upon God. And so that's how, how the judgment will take place. One who has been here and done that and understands how it all works. So then he continues, verse 20, 28, 29. Marvel not at this. Okay, so, so he, again, don't, don't, don't be amazed at what I'm telling you for the hour is coming. Now notice, remember he said the hour is coming in verse 25. The hour is coming and now is. But verse 28, he says, uh, marvel not at this for the hour is coming. And here he's speaking of a future day. And, and, and so, uh, let me just finish reading this. Um, Marvel not, verse 28, uh, the hour is coming in which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth, they that have done good unto the resurrection of life and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. Now remember back up in verse 25, he said the hour is coming and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God. I think he's speaking of the spiritually dead. They're gonna hear the voice of the Son of God. And, and they're, and they're going to, and those that hear, those who respond shall live. But now in verse 20, 28 um, and 29, or at the end of verse 28, notice he says that those that are in the graves, so he's speaking of physical bodies in the graves, they shall hear his voice. See, that first voice was the voice of the present, the voice calling now, the voice of salvation. But the voice Jesus mentions in verse 28, it's still his voice, obviously, but it's in a future scenario. And that's a sovereign voice. And it's a voice that no one can resist. It's the voice that's going to call those, those, those bodies into resurrection. Now we know from, from later scriptures and other places that there's two, two resurrections. There's one unto, a, a resurrection of life and also a resurrection of damnation. That those happen at different times. But in each one, the final verdict, the, the final decision maker will be the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, remember in verse 19, you know, what, what is the, the, the uh, those that have done good and those that have done evil? So what, what, is the, what is the distinction of done good and done evil? Well, I think that it goes back to what Jesus said in verse 19. I do nothing of myself. That is the essence of godliness. Jesus said that a number of times. I've not come to do my will, but, but the will of him that sent me. And, and at the, at the, at the, in, in the Garden of Gethsemane, he said, um, you know, not my will, but thine be done. That is the essence of godliness. That is the standard by which we're going to be judged. Now, there's other things as well, we understand. But that's ultimately what's, what it comes down to. That loving God and loving others. If we love God, then we've submitted to God. We depend upon him. That dependence upon God. So that we live in harmony with him and thus love him. That is doing good, okay? So, so finding that aspect here in the context is that dependence upon God. And so as a, as a human being, okay, we need to depend, first and foremost, depend upon the work of Christ upon the cross, his death and resurrection, to depend upon what he did for us. That's faith. 
Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That's dependence. Depend upon what Jesus has done. Depend upon who he is as a son of God. Depend upon his work of death on Calvary as your sin substitute. Taking your place so that you could be redeemed. And so that's where this dependence comes. I come. I'm depending upon God to take me to heaven. And so I think a Christian can say, hey, if God is not taking me there, I have no other options. Because I'm not dependent upon myself to be saved. And so that's where it all begins. And then it continues as a believer. Then we live by faith and not by sight. We trust him and not ourselves. We lean not to our own understanding. We keep depending upon God to, to live for him and to accomplish the will of our Father which is in heaven. So that, that is that's following the steps of Christ. And so to those people, there's a resurrection of life into the blessed presence of Almighty God forever. But those who live independent of God, independent of the gospel, independent of trust in Christ, independent of, of God's offer of love, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And they've never responded in that dependent faith to say, I'm trusting him to do what I can't do for myself. And of course, if that's, that's at the core where you've never trusted Christ, then the rest of it will follow. It will be doing evil. It will be doing things independent of God, and he says they will experience the resurrection of damnation, facing the eternal justice of God for what they have done in their sin. So as Jesus is speaking about this, this end time scenario of judgment, and, and as a Christian, this, this, this resurrection unto life, in doing good, there will be an accountable time, not whether you go to heaven or hell, but the rewards you receive at the judgment seat of Christ where he will evaluate your life as a Christian. And so we, we still need to serve. But notice verse 20, whether it's at the judgment seat of Christ or the great white throne judgment, notice what Jesus adds when he speaks of him being the judge. I can of my own self do nothing. Remember what he said in verse 19 as he started this whole, this whole explanation to them. If you're making yourself God, and he said there in verse 19, I, the son can do nothing of himself. So he ends this same uh, section here. He says, I can of my own self do nothing. Now, the only difference is he goes from calling, uh, speaking of himself as the son to uh, the personal pronoun, the, the first person personal pronoun, I can do nothing of myself. So he, he's just, he's, he's saying, okay, let me, let me explain to you as I summarize this for you. I, I, the son of God, I've come here, but I'm not doing this of myself. This being the final judge for the destiny of humanity, it's not self-appointed. I didn't take this position on my own. And I'm not going to judge on my own. Because notice what he said, very interesting to me. He says, I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge. As I hear what? The evidence? No, I don't think that's what he's speaking of. What has he spoken about earlier about hearing? Remember, he talks about the son hearing the father. Uh, remember back, what he talks about seeing the father, I guess, back there earlier, but the very similar thing. As I hear, I judge. And this is where I said the father's not absent from this final decision making. Jesus says, as I hear, I judge. In other words, I'm listening to the Father, the Father and the Son, and really the Spirit. We're, we're all in one, in harmony. When it comes to judgment, it's not just one of us, it's all of us. It's the triune God bringing these judgments to bear. So they're not, they're not self-centered, because notice what he goes on to say. And my judgment is just. I bring just judgment. Proper justice will be, be, be done because... I seek not my own will, but the will of my Father which hath sent me, or the will of the Father which hath sent me. So he, he's not judging in spite, okay? He's not judging with revenge. He's judging in perfect justice because he's going to continue to do the will of his Father which is in heaven. That's who he's listening to. So folks, as we stand before the Lord in final judgment, it will be absolutely impartial. Comparing us to the perfect standard of God, which is first of all written in his word. Jesus said in another place, says, I judge not, but the things which I have spoken, those shall judge you. And so uh, by, by, the, by the words that God has written for us, but also by the example 
of those words, or those, you could say, those, those words exemplified in the life and ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. So all of us will one day face Jesus. Jesus, the one who died for us and rose again. We will face him in that final day. I hope, if you have not yet, that you would trust him alone so that you face him as your evaluator in the sense of giving you rewards instead of the final judge who will toss you out of his presence. We don't want to be part of that resurrection unto damnation, but that resurrection unto life. So Jesus, as he spoke, he said, My father worketh hitherto, and I work. And they say, You're making yourself equal to God. And he says, Yes, I am, because that's who I am. I am the very Son of God who provides life and will bring judgment uh, at the end time and even in time. So let me ask you, are you ready? Are you saved? I hope you, you are. If not, trust Christ even right now. You'll hear the voice of the Son of God, um, you know, and, and you trust him right now. There, I'm, I'm trying to remember that, that verse now um, where, where he said there in... Uh, uh, the hour is coming and now is. So now is the time. Now is the day of salvation. And then as a Christian, let me ask you, how are you doing on your dependent living? Are you living in dependence on God? Are you looking to Him? Because really, that dependence on God is where we enjoy sweet fellowship, which Jesus had. And maybe we get to the place in our life where we say, you know, I do nothing of myself. I'm doing the will of him that sent me into this world. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your truth. We pray for your blessing. Lord, I pray that your word would, would not return to you void, but would accomplish that which you please and your purpose. Again, I pray if anyone listening is not in Christ, I pray they would trust him today. And Lord, for those who do know you, I pray you'd help us to live in that likeness to Christ, in that dependent spirit upon you, our Father. Thank you for salvation in, in your Son. Thank you that he is your very Son. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you.